moment as we uh, change over to our next guest, who is an amazing uh, US lawyer, Kevin Zies, who also uh, uh, co-directs uh, popularresistance.org. Hi, Kevin, can you hear me? Okay. You may have. There we go, okay. can you hear me? Yes, perfect, All right, great. great. Very few problems. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Happy to uh, do it. I'm sorry that it's under, uh, under a situation where it's a little bit of bad news, but the good news is that we haven't seen Julian Assange uh, expelled from the embassy. Uh, do you uh, just, you know, to open things up, do you have any uh, comments on the, the recent news that we've seen uh, come out of WikiLeaks and Ecuador? Yes. Well, of course, the fact that Julian is being threatened with being removed and sent to the United States uh, to face long term incarceration is not good news. And it shows the thin thread uh, that Julian hangs on with. Uh, it, but it also shows that people responded uh, when these threats got serious. Uh, we saw people get involved, uh, come out, uh, speak out. Your your work and the Consortium News work on this has been fantastic, not just over this recent crisis, but over the long term. Uh, and I think that's helping to create the kind of galvanized response we need. I don't think that uh, Ecuador expected the response they got. Uh, the UN coming out, speaking out against uh, allowing Julian Assange to be extradited. Uh, I don't think he, they expected that. And so I think they've slowed down. Now, the, the, the political realities of Ecuador are not good. Uh, the vice president, if he takes over because of the corruption of Marino, uh, will be a problem also. And so it, it, this is a good people should realize we people responded and it stopped what Ecuador planned. We showed that we have the power to make a difference, but this is just a way, an, a, another step, and we'll have to be doing this again and again and again until the United States comes to its senses and no longer threatens Julian Assange with prosecution for doing his job as a publisher and editor of an important news outlet, WikiLeaks. So we have to make the United States come to its senses on, on this case. Absolutely. And, and do you see uh, any sort of uh, progress being made in, in the American public as, uh, as far as coming to its senses is concerned? Or do you see, since, for example, the, the discussion about the Mueller report, you know, coming to a head a few weeks ago, do you see things getting worse or better in that regard as far as public well, opinion? I think, you know, they've done an incredible character assassination of uh, Julian Assange, uh, the the sexual assault uh, attack that never even resulted in a prosecution, uh, you know, was an investigation that after it should have, it was actually initially stopped by more than one prosecutor and then a political politicized prosecutor brought it forward, but she even was unable to bring it to any kind of actual prosecution and then finally gave up. Uh, that was a character assassination. The, uh, out, the, 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 relationship between Julian Assange and the Trump campaign have been uh, used also as part of a character assassination. So we were certainly in a position where there was a lack of political support because of that. This is not uncommon. This is the way U.S. government reacts when anyone uh, does these kinds of uh, aggressive responses to the abuse of U.S. government. Uh, we saw this happen with people who now, like Martin Luther King Jr., who now has a memorial on uh, the, the mall in Washington, D.C., and his states named across the country for him is now seen as a hero. He was undermined in character assassination efforts by the FBI and the federal government uh, and also local governments when he was active. Uh, so I, I have no doubt Julian Assange is doing incredibly important work. He has, uh, he has exposed widespread crimes by the U.S. and other governments as well as corporations. So he's taken on the power structure and the power structure responds like this. Uh, and so, but I do think that, especially, you know, the Chelsea, Chelsea Manning's uh, grand jury situation and Chelsea refusing to buckle under to the pressure of uh, a federal judge in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, and going to jail in order to not participate in a secret uh, tribunal, a grand jury, uh, I think help to galvanize public opinion again. I think the kind of the kind of work that uh, you're doing and others are doing to raise consciousness is also helping to 
get public opinion going in support of Julian Assange. So I think we're making progress. And I think the response to this attack shows the progress you're making. Um, my sense is we can keep, keep building progress. Uh, so I, I think we're, it's going in a good direction, but it's an uphill battle because uh, the power structure certainly wants to uh, undermine uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. They've done incredible damage with their truth telling. And uh, they, the power structure is not very forgiving. <laughs> as we can see in many U.S. actions around the world, uh, in Venezuela, and Ecuador, and other countries. Right, and it's interesting, and especially speaking of that, it's, uh, our previous guest, Nzomi Hayase, uh, d mentioned uh, Martin Luther King and Gandhi and others as well, who were um, assassinated, and then, you know, now we revere them, but at the time, as you say, they were um, just demonized. And I think uh, one of the things that Nozomi said was, well, you know, it's, the internet has made a difference in this case because uh, he hasn't been assassinated. And also, you know, we know about the, the forces against him now. And maybe, maybe people weren't quite as aware of the active um, effort to attack and demonize uh, those figures by the state as much as they are now, at least amongst supporters. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. WikiLeaks was founded in 2010. And the stories they exposed with a variety of leaks, of course, the Chelsea Manning leaks were very important on the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, the State Department, how it serves transnational corporations on Guantanamo Bay and that prison, that illegal prison that the U.S. continues to have exposed all that. But so many other leaks as well. Those are just that was just some. Um, and, you know, so they found in 2010 and for six, almost seven of those years, Julian Assange has been in the embassy. That's pretty amazing uh, to think of what they've accomplished, uh, even with that kind. And in the last year or so, with the silencing of Assange, um, you know, they still have done probably more than any publication to expose U.S. crimes around the world and crimes of others and, and other governments and uh, transnational corporations. It's a pretty amazing record, especially when you think he's been uh, in the embassy for almost seven years. No doubt, no doubt at all, and I think absolutely it's it's a stunning um, accomplishment that they've had. In in you know, yeah, go ahead. You know, the one thing I really want to uh, emphasize uh, in the past, I've talked when we've done these, I've talked about how this is the kind of the uh, John Peter Zenger case of the 21st century because it will define press freedom, it will def 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 define democratization of the media, which needs to happen because we can't trust our current media. They don't do a good job uh, telling us the truth of what's really going on, on in the United States or around the world. But what, as I've been thinking about this case more, what the, what the Assange case really shows is system failure on so many fronts. International law. It's, it's not Julian Assange who should be facing prosecution. He should be protected by international law. The people who've been exposed by Julian Assange and the corporations and governments that have been exposed by WikiLeaks are the ones who should be prosecuted. But international law is unable to do that. That shows an area where you need a lot of work. Uh, it shows the failure of the US government. Um, when these kinds of crimes and corruption are exposed by their own documents, by their own documents, what's the response of the US government? Threaten the leaker. Threaten the publication, threaten the media. That kill the messenger, yeah. Kill the messenger, uh, rather than prosecute the criminals. Uh, and that goes for Hillary Clinton, uh, it goes for Barack Obama, it goes for George Bush. I mean, it's uh, generals, colonels, uh, State Department officials. Their criminality has been shown without any doubt. And what's the response of the U.S. government? Who has been prosecuted? Uh, and it shows the incredible failure, not just of the courts and the prosecutorial system, U.S. attorneys across the country. We have prosecutors in every state. We have attorney generals in every state. We have U.S. attorneys across the country. Who's done anything to prosecute these crimes? It's a fraudulent court system that can't Absolutely. prosecute. You can't. Uh, torture has been exposed. That's a violation of international law and domestic law. Has anyone been prosecuted for only action? John Kiriaki. Only John Kiriaki, Kiriaki. Not, not for torture, but for leaking, for yeah. admitting it. Exactly. Uh, and so, so that's a failure. It also shows a failure in the so-called checks and balances that exist in the you know, 
uh, U.S. government, you have a, a three branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the courts. The courts have failed, but so has the legislature. What has Congress done? Either house, either party, nothing. They've allowed these war crimes. They've allowed this open corruption of the State Department uh, doing the business of corporations rather than what's good for the nation and the world. Uh, to go uh, without any checks and balances. Nothing. They have done absolutely nothing. Uh, it shows the failure of our two-party so-called democracy. And I do say so-called because, uh, you know, I went to Venezuela recently, and their democracy is so much superior than U.S. democracy in multiple ways. You know, Maduro is called a dictator falsely in the media, but the reality is they are more of a democracy in many ways in the United States. And I'm gonna be writing an article about this. I haven't had time yet since our recent trip. We had an excellent meeting with the National Electoral Commission. Uh, I was there for the, the presidential election uh, a year ago, uh, as well as recently in the last month. And on many levels, I can go into this if we have time a little bit later, but on many levels, starting with the right to vote, which they have and we don't have in our constitution, starting with an electoral system that is audited and confidently without any fraud. We don't have that in the United States. Of course not. Yeah. Uh, on, on many levels, uh, you know, we, our democracy, that's why I call it a so-called democracy, because it's really a, uh, a, a charade democracy with manipulated elections. Uh, it's a, a charade democracy to provide cover for oligarchs, for Wall Street, and for weapons makers. And the Julian Assange case kind of proves that. Uh, the fact that the weapons makers, the Wall Street corruption uh, that's been exposed in WikiLeaks publications has gone unprosecuted and instead they threatened to prosecute the messenger uh, is an example of that. So it, it shows the failure of international level of governance, international courts. It shows the failure of domestic courts in the United States, the checks and balances, the legislature failure. And it also shows the incredible failure of the media. The media, I mean, thank you, Consortium News, for doing this work. Thank you for your independent journalism. Uh, but the media, the commercial media, is totally failing uh, on this case. Uh, we had been, WikiLeaks really opened up an important new avenue in 21st century media. And we have such a concentrated corporate media with six large corporations controlling 90% of the media. Uh, these corporations have boards of directors that tie them to all the major corporations. Uh, they have close ties to the government, uh, and uh, they just do not report the news honestly. They just don't report the news honestly. Uh, you know, that's one of the things, another thing in Venezuela that we saw, and I also, also saw it in Iran. I was in Iran two weeks before Venezuela, and that was one of the commonalities of both visits, was we're being lied to. And when you're in those countries and see it, the lies are more obvious. For example, when we were in Venezuela, uh, the uh, American Airlines stopped flying to Venezuela. Why? Because the pilots union uh, said that they didn't want their pilots taking the risk of flying into Venezuela because of the widespread civil unrest and the uh, threat that any American could be, uh, could be arrested at any time for no reason. Has anyone mentioned any American who's been arrested for no reason in Venezuela? I, I, don't, I don't know of any case. On the day that that, was, that American Amer Airlines uh, announcement was made and our flights were canceled, we actually went out on the streets to show the civil unrest. Uh, we videotaped uh, families having ice cream. We videotaped uh, people walking uh, on walking streets shopping and going to restaurants. We videotaped people in parks. Uh, we went to uh, both the wealthy neighborhoods and the barrios when we were in Venezuela and saw no crime, saw no, no, no homelessness and no poverty. We saw no civil unrest. And yet in the United States, the propaganda put out by the pilots union, put out by the State Department, put out by even, even uh, Bernie Sanders you know, was that there was this dictator who uh, was authoritarian and the place uh, Venezuelans were in poverty. It was all lies. And so we're being lied to. And that's why the democratization of the media, 
uh, by WikiLeaks, by creating tools that allow for people to expose the truth uh, through the release of documents anonymously uh, to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks can, can, can then vet them and make sure they're legitimate. And they've never been caught, by the way, publishing a lie. They published amazing materials uh, and never been caught publishing a lie. Uh, and so that de democratization of media allowing whistleblowers to operate more easily and expose the truth about government at all levels, expose the truth about corporations, transnational and major corporations, uh, the corruption of how corporations corrupt U.S. government and foreign policy, uh, showing war crimes uh, in, 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 in visceral ways. Uh, that is something that the corporate media should be doing if they were doing their job. They don't. They don't exactly. because they're, they're corrupt. So that's another institution. You know, international courts, UN is not able to do enough. They uh, think we've gotten some good reports from uh, UN special reporters on, uh, on, on not allowing Julian Assange to be extradited. So we've gotten some individuals doing good stuff, but the UN is not powerful enough to deal with US crimes. Congress isn't, the courts aren't, the prosecutors aren't, the media isn't. So this WikiLeaks case really shows the failure of the systems that we all have to live under. And I think that's why you're seeing popular movements growing not just in the U.S. but around the world. Why you're why you're seeing the why you're seeing the yellow vest movement in uh, in France, uh, pushing back against Neil because the corruption of the Macron government is evident. Uh, that's why you're seeing the EU struggling because the corporate domination of the EU is evident, uh, and that's that means the corruption of the EU is evident, and so uh, it's a fragile um, uh, union. Because of its, because of that there. So on all these fronts, we have a democracy crisis because the people see the corruption. And WikiLeaks has been a key player in ex in showing us that corruption. And that's why Julian Julian Assange's character has been assassinated uh, because the truth of what he has done uh, has been so powerful and so important that uh, it should be something that all the media is shouting about. Uh, and I think the people in the United States need to continue to organize uh, and educate and mobilize to support uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks because it's really critical uh, to the direction, not just of media, but the direction of government and the, re the, the direction of corporate domination of government, uh, where WikiLeaks has done such um, amazing work. Absolutely. And I think uh, part of the, the effect of the failure of all those institutions that you just mentioned is the fact that we're having a conversation, whether it's on Unity 4J or whether it's in the street with our relatives and friends and, and associates and whatever. Uh, our conversation is always, well, this is why I, I support or defend Chelsea Manning and WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. This is like we have that the whole conversation is centered around, around why you should not believe the propaganda about their personalities or their lives. And that is the failure of all those institutions that you just mentioned, because the conversation, as you are alluding to, that we should be having is all, on all of the corruption and, and misdeeds and criminality that WikiLeaks has shown. And because of the, the psychological warfare that's been waged on the um, you know, U.S. public and on the global public, we don't have that conversation. And I, I think that that's, you know, and, that, and, that allows, and that allows criminality to continue. Right. And one of the impacts of criminality, whether it's government or corporate, uh, but not being punished, the re what that causes is more criminality. It causes more corruption. Uh, and so the failure to stop corruption invites more corruption. Uh, and unfortunately, what they're trying to do with the, the uh, threats to Julian Assange uh, is to stop others from coming forward and exposing corruption. Exposing the realities, exposing the reality of war crimes. Uh, you know what we're seeing in, uh, in the attacks on Venezuela, the threats on Iran, the continued activities of the U.S. in Syria, uh, the, the mess we've let, the destruction of Libya, uh, Yemen. The list is so long. Afghanistan after a never-ending war in Afghanistan. All this continues because of these corrupt systems. People are profiting from the destruction of millions of lives. That's what's happening. People are profiting from that. People are profiting from the destruction of the environment 
by the, the lies about uh, climate change and the denial of the reality of climate change is already killing 100,000 people a year and will kill hundreds of thousands more annually because we lie about it. Our media lies about it. Our politicians lie about it. Our governments are unable to respond to these crises. Uh, and so uh, that's why this case is so important. Uh, we need much more of a democratized media. We need much more of an independent media. We need much more of a diverse, diversified media. If we had a legitimate government, we would see a breakup of the media so that six corporations could not control the, the media reaching millions of people. We wouldn't allow the uh, mergers and monopolies uh, of media at all levels, whether it's local television uh, to cable to uh, broadcast media or print media, we've allowed monopolization. And that means corporate domination by a handful of big corporations. And so it all just makes democratization more important. That's why I describe uh, the prosecution of the, the threatened prosecution of Julian Assange as the John Peter Zenger case of the 21st century. If people, people remember what, who John Peter Zenger was, he was a publisher in New York, New York in the colonial era. At that time period, even telling the truth about the governor or other political figures that was negative, even if it was truthful, was against the law. You couldn't tell the truth about the governor and uh, what the governor was doing that was uh, corrupt. Uh, and so he was prosecuted for telling the truth publishing the truth. And uh, it was out of that prosecution that the First Amendment was born. Uh, the, and, and the idea that truth is a defense uh, to prosecution. Uh, and that was a new concept then. Well, we have a new concept now. And that's the concept of a democratized media where publishers cannot be prosecuted for publishing documents that are truthful. Uh, and we don't know whether there's an indictment of uh, Julian Assange right now. There was a leak, a kind of a leak, a, a so, maybe a typo uh, from the prosecutor who was involved in the grand jury, uh, who was also prosecuting an unrelated case and had a, a paragraph that he published in the, in, in the court documents that seemed to indicate that there was an indictment. Uh, so, but we don't really know because obviously the grand jury is continuing and they continue to take testimony uh, because we know Chelsea Manning uh, is incarcerated for refusing to participate in that uh, grand jury that would threaten uh, freedom of press and our right to know uh, in the 21st century. Uh, and we really owe such a debt to Chelsea Manning. Um, I know when she ran for the U.S. Senate uh, in Maryland, I spent some time with her, and I know that, that what she went through uh, after that leak that she made to WikiLeaks, the prosecution, the being held in solitary confinement, uh, being abused by prison authorities uh, is, you know, a devastating part of her history. And to have to relive that now. Voluntarily. Voluntarily. Around. Yeah. And being held in solitary, uh, you know, now for more than a month, uh, I, how we, we owe such a debt to her. And I hope people will do what they can to support Chelsea Manning on Popular Resistance, which is our organization, popularresistance.org. One of the sliders is to support Chelsea Manning, another one's to support Julian Assange. Uh, so you can go to that and uh, find out how you can write to Chelsea, how you can support her, how her rent can be paid while she's incarcerated, uh, and because she really deserves our support. But I, I really just hope that people see that people power makes a difference that we were told a few days ago this was imminent within hours. Assange could be put into the, the handcuffs of British authorities and uh, sent to the United States where he could face an unfair trial in our corrupt Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal, uh, Fourth Circuit in Alexandria, Virginia, the rocket docket that prosecutes national security cases. Uh, he would get an unfair trial there with an unfair jury and very likely an unfair sentence. And so people standing up, stop that. People power made a difference. And we are at this stage in the WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning mobilization that we have a lot more room to mobilize. And so people power has just barely been felt. And I have, I have no doubt that if we build this people power, 
we can convince uh, the prosecutors in Alexandria, the Trump administration, the Department of Justice, that Assange should not be prosecuted and that this prosecution should be withdrawn. They are trying to twist and turn the law in order to prosecute Assange. They know that under the es Espionage Act, which has never been used against a publisher, it would put freedom of speech at risk and not just a threat to WikiLeaks, but to the New York Times and to the traditional corporate media, as well as, of course, independent media. And so a prosecution on the Espionage Act would be a very serious blow. So they're trying to find a way, it seems like, to make uh, a publisher into a co-conspirator with Chelsea Manning. Uh, and that is just uh, a stretch. It's not a, I mean, this is a normal course of reporting for reporters to try to encourage leaks. That's what reporters do. Uh, good reporters, at least, uh, are able to convince people who have the uh, ability to provide accurate government documents to leak those. Uh, that's not a, a criminal conspiracy. That's reporting. And so they are going to have to stretch the law a great deal in order to um, prosecute Julian Assange. And so I have no doubt that if we create enough public noise and uh, educate people, organize them and mobilize them, that we can stop this prosecution. We can stop this extradition. Uh, they, they fight. There will be a fight over extradition in the UK if it gets to that stage. And we can mobilize to stop that. We can mobilize to stop the prosecution. Uh, we can be mobilizing every step of the way to protect Julian Assange. And I think it's our responsibility as activists to do so. If we, without a democratized media, uh, we're not going to get the changes we need. And we need a lot of changes on a lot of fronts. Not just the, the militarization and the Wall Street corruption front, but many fronts uh, of struggle. And we're seeing progress on many fronts in the United States, a lot of organizing going on, but a linchpin of that, a critical linchpin of that, uh, really a foundational linchpin of that is for our ability to get the truth out. Because the method of operation to protect the status quo and those who profit from denying people their human necessities uh, that, that uh, undermine the uh, safety of the environment and deny climate change that allow the degradation of the environment that's so widespread on so many fronts, the, the never-ending wars, the basis of all that is lies. And those lies come from elected officials and the corporate media. And so it's so essential for us to protect the democratized media space that WikiLeaks has begun to open up. And they know that. The people in power know that. And that's why Julian Assange is being threatened with essentially you know, decades in prison uh, for publishing the truth. Absolutely, and I think that point about the fact that WikiLeaks has created the space for independent media to kind of rise up is completely a huge point. And I, it's something that is so, so true that if WikiLeaks hadn't been publishing everything that they have, there would be so much less material for independent media to report on. And I definitely agree with you on that. And I think as well, like, the fact that, you know, on one level, we have the corruption of these institutions, which don't get prosecuted, as you say, and they don't even, on top of not having to fear prosecution, they don't even have to fear the media calling them out for the lack of prosecution, because they know that the media is bought and paid for. So yeah, as you said, WikiLeaks is the only kind of major organization really turning the tide against that trend. Um, so what, in trying to raise people power, though, how can you, what do you advise our audience to do to try to help with that effort, if anything? Well, yeah, well, it starts with education. Uh, and so I think we need to keep on getting out the point that WikiLeaks is doing, did an incredible job and continues to do an incredible job on getting the truth out and how important it is. But I think we also have to confront the, uh, the partisan nonsense uh, of those who blame uh, WikiLeaks for the election of Donald Trump. Uh, and this comes from the Clinton campaign, the Democratic National Committee, and Democrats generally, uh, who blame WikiLeaks. What did WikiLeaks do? It published the truth. The problem was not WikiLeaks. The problem was the truth. The problem was Hillary Clinton, uh, is a, was a, as she said in her, in her emails, she's two-faced. She says one thing in public, and behind closed doors, she says another thing to Wall Street 
and the weapons makers and the transnational corporations and Walmart, whose board she used to sit on. Um, her failure as a uh, politician is why she lost the election. She lost the election for a, a lousy campaign that didn't campaign in Wisconsin, rode off the Midwest, didn't campaign adequately in Michigan, didn't adequately campaign in Pennsylvania. Uh, she thought those working class people in those areas would just not support her. Uh, and so she failed the campaign and she had a lousy record. She had a record that had supported war consistently throughout her 35 years as in office and as first lady. Uh, and uh, she had a consistent record of supporting corporatism and Wall Street and essentially trying to mislead people about what she actually stood for. And the WikiLeaks uh, release of the emails from the DNC exposed the truth of the DNC. They were working in cahoots with Hillary Clinton to stop the more popular candidate, Bernie Sanders. And if Sanders had been the nominee, we may not have Donald Trump. So whose fault is that? Uh, you know, you, blaming Donald blaming Donald Trump on WikiLeaks is is a, a false blame. The blame is on the DNC, on Hillary Clinton, and on the Democratic Party for failing to give the voters what they want. This is always the problem the Democratic Party, and you can see it now with the Medicare for All fight. Uh, just the other, the other day, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what more needs to be said? <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, she said some incredibly stupid things about Medicare for All. I mean, she said uh, that she doesn't think that Medicare for All can provide people with the benefits that they get under the ACA. It's this absolute nonsense. And she knows it. That's what makes it. She knows that she's lying to, and trying to confuse people because the under Medicare for All, improved Medicare for All, people have access to every doctor, every hospital, every health provider in the country. There's no narrow network like we have under the insurance system. People don't have to get new insurance every few years under the insurance system. If you change your job or your job changes their insurance you have to, or cancels their insurance, you have to get new insurance. Under Medicare for All, you have it for life from birth to death. Uh, you have every body part covered. It's not body part medicine like insurance is. Insurance may not cover your eyes or your ears or your dental work or your mental health or drug addiction. Or uh, children, uh, childbirth and all of that. Child yeah. That's, and uh, and under, under Medicare for All, it covers all of that. Everything is covered. So for Nancy Pelosi to lie and say that people won't get the benefits equal to the ACA is an outright lie. But what that shows us, the point I'm trying to make is that shows the Democrats' problem. The Democrat voters, 85% want Medicare for All, only 5% oppose it. So that's about as much national consensus in the Democratic Party as you can have. And yet the Democratic leader the Speaker of the House is not so outright advocating for it. Instead, she's advocating for the corporations because she's a big money raiser. That's how she keeps her job as Speaker, by raising hundreds of millions of dollars. She knows she's going to raise hundreds of millions of dollars again in 2020. She wants that money from the insurance industry. She wants that money from the pharmaceuticals. She wants that money from the for-profit health providers. And so she doesn't want to challenge them. She's putting the interests of the profiteers who fund them ahead of the desires and necessities of the people. And that is why they have to find blame when they lose to such terrible Republicans as George W. Bush or Donald Trump. You know, in the George W. Bush era, they blamed Ralph Nader. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, for, we were for, actually discussing that in the last segment, actually. Oh, that yeah? came up. Yeah. And I, and I thought of Bernie Sanders and the way he was demonized, especially uh, just in the in the wake of the 2016 presidential election as as the spoiler, just like Ralph Nader. Yeah. When, yeah, of course, that's, not, they, that's not the case. And, but, and they blame Russia, you know, rather, yeah, and, and, rather than looking in the mirror and blame themselves. And the, the fact <laughs> that we had that three year discussion about Russiagate and God forbid we debunk it. It, yes. The whole, even debunking it was still taking time away from these discussions about Medicare for all or whatever other issues that the Democrats are being completely hypocritical on. We missed so out that, on that discussion. So that, the answer to your question is that we have to get people, I mean, because they tried to character assassinate Julian Assange by saying he elected Trump when what he really did was report the truth. And Hillary Clinton and the Democrats elected Trump because they were so poor, just like Al Gore is a wooden candidate and he elected George W. Bush. And John Kerry was a, a candidate, a terrible candidate, who also got Bush reelected. 
with his reporting to duty rather than ending the Iraq war nonsense and not supporting a minimum wage increase. I mean, so Democrats have to stop looking in the, need to start looking in the mirror and stop blaming Julian Assange or anybody else. And so I think that voters, activists don't need to realize that they should not be blaming Julian Assange for the reality of Donald Trump. And so we need to, co activists need to aggressively come around and show solidarity with Julian Assange, show solidarity with WikiLeaks. We've already shown in the last few days that this mobilization stopped Ecuador from an imminent threat that was just a few hours away. Now it's been stopped. Now Ecuador has backed away and said, well, we're not, we didn't mean that. No, we're not, not we're not going to, we're not going to, there's not, no, there's no, no decision has been made. Yeah. Uh, and that's because people power. Yeah. So I hope people take this power and realize they have it. And because the threats are not going to end. And so we need to, people need to, once, it, once this threat dies down, we can't forget. We've got, got to continue to educate, organize, and mobilize around Julian Assange, around Chelsea Manning, and around WikiLeaks to get this prosecution threat stopped, to get Chelsea Manning released, and to allow WikiLeaks to do its job which has been heroic around democratizing the media and getting out the truth that the corporate media and the politicians don't want us to know. And how you can have a democracy when the people don't know what's really going on, it's absurd. It's essential for democracy that we have a democratized media and WikiLeaks has been the cutting edge to create that democratized media. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that, that I was reminded of as you were speaking about that is the fact that, you know, the people power that we've seen at the embassy on Unity 4J, on social media, etc., and some independent media um, has been really great. But I, I look at stuff like uh, like the Yellow Vest protests and yes. I see and I see the, um, you know, hands off Venezuela protests, you know, pro Maduro protests in Venezuela and the energy behind that. And I, I really want to see the day when the type of energy in those protests is brought to the embassy. And I know that many of us who support Assange can't physically travel to the embassy. But when the you know movement to support Assange has that level of commitment right. from that number of people, I think that's when it'll have been really successful. So um and I've, I've talked to some other guests about this, but I want your perspective on it. Why is it that so many people in France for you know, 20, 21 weeks now have been protesting um, you know, against the Macron government, as we mentioned earlier, but so many people have still bought propaganda about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? You know, wh how can we get that anger and energy from the, the, that, those populist uh, protests into supporting WikiLeaks and Julian Assange? Well, you know, I think the, the French Yellow Vest movement is a really good example of an opportunity because uh, the Yellow Vest movement uh, in France sees the corruption of media. Uh, they have not only directed their anger at Macron uh, and his neoliberal uh, policies for the wealthy, they've also directed their anger at the corporate media because they've seen the media lying about them. Uh, and so they have gone to uh, TV stations and uh, news publications and protested outside of them. So I think that actually is a very winnable target. And we have to remember when we, when any kind of activist work, we have to remember that it doesn't take a majority of people being active in order to have an impact. It really takes two things. We got to work toward these two things. The first thing is we need to develop a national consensus that democratized media demonstrated by WikiLeaks is essential for the future of free, free speech, free press, and our right to know. We've got to get people educated. And, that, and that, that's a very sellable point because people don't trust the corporate media. Right. I, so. I don't think anywhere in the world, but certainly not in the United States. Polls show corporate media, you know, trust levels at their lowest. They keep going down. Their viewership and their readership are declining independent media and social media are going up and have more credibility. So people, I think, already have that sense. So we have to crystallize that consensus that a democratized media is essential for the 21st century. People being the media can provide us with information that the corporate media will not provide us with. And that WikiLeaks has done a an, an, an very important work in creating the avenue for democratized media to exist. So that's the first thing. Develop national consensus. 
And we got to keep working on that. The second thing is we only need a small percentage of people to be mobilized in support of that national consensus. On popularresistance.org, we have a, a, a school, a school of social transformation. If you go to the popularresistance.org website, one of the top choices on it is school. And that's a, a school of eight classes, each class one hour long, that describes how social transformation occurs and really provides a guide for people to build movements that are successful. Uh, and uh, I, I really hope, we, we see the 2020s as an incredible potential decade for transformation. As we talked about earlier in this hour, how WikiLeaks is, uh, it, the treatment of WikiLeaks indicates systemic problems in international governments, domestic US governments, domestic courts, domestic prosecutions, Congress, the media, system-wide problems in all these areas. It's gonna take systematic change. And um, the 2020s are gonna see that kind of change because crises issues are getting so big and coming to such a high peak at the same time that movements are organizing around 15 fronts of struggle, which we describe on popularresistance.org. Uh, you know, in our daily news reporting, we cover the movements in the US and around the world. You can get our daily newsletter and stay on top of that. But um, you can see that movements are responding to the crises, they're organizing, they're mobilizing. And the 2020s are going to be a decade of transformation. And they could be very positive transformation. So we put that school of social transformation on popularresistance.org under the school section because we believe that we need to have lots of leaders. It's not going to be one or two people uh, who are, are, you know, Martin Luther Kings. It's going to take leaders across the country and around the world understanding how social transformation works what the roles of movements are, how movements develop, what our, uh, our, our overall strategy is, how you build movements so that they can be successful, and what the opposition is going to do to block movements. When you know what the opposition is going to do, and they, we can see it happening in many fronts. We can see exactly a Medicare for All, for example, which is getting close to a, a victory phase, which I think will occur in the early 2020s. We can see you know, when the Nancy Pelosi's and Corporate Democrats are putting out these fake Medicare for all, uh, Medicare for some proposals, uh, Medicare extra for some, you know, Medicare plus, anything but Medicare for all, They're trying to use our language. This is classic, and you'll see it in, this, in the School for Transformation, uh, how this occurs. And you'll see how we've succeeded on various issues uh, over recent years, but also, also over history. And so I'd urge people to learn how movements work and what we can do. Because I think in this WikiLeaks case, the people power is essential to overcome the people in power who want to protect themselves from the truth. They don't want a democratized media telling the people the truth. They want a corporate media confusing people and telling people lies. And so we have to understand how to build movements, how to make movements work, and how to respond when the opposition, the status quo, pushes back against us. I have no, conf no doubt we can win the WikiLeaks issue and a multitude of issues in the 2020s. We have, you know, we've seen incredible people power in our history and recently. You know, and so I'd, I'd urge people, if they want to protect Julian Assange, realize how we have to build a movement to do that and what we can. That we're, make, we're, on, we're showing that progress. We can do that. And so uh, this recent effort of stopping Ecuador from who is threatening within hours to remove Julian and uh, give him over to the United States through Great Britain, uh, that we stop that shows that people power already at its st small stage, and we have a lot of potential to grow, uh, can make a big difference and really stop this kind of uh, prosecution of uh, someone who's a publisher of the tr truth and should be given a medal, not, a, not, not be prosecuted. Yeah, absolutely. As a be as a beginning, totally. And I think that, um, you know, it's really, really important, official... as you said, to educate people on the reality rather than buying into those From narratives Ecuador, that the media just keeps on uh, pummeling us with. But one of the things that I've noticed as an issue, I guess I'd call it an issue that's come up um, 
through uh, when I publish an article on, on WikiLeaks or Julian Assange or when I, when I talk about on, uh, news regarding those issues on social media, I see that amongst conservatives, there's a, there's a group of, of um, people that have basically bought into a narratives like QAnon, et cetera. And it basically seems to have pacified them and they'll respond to news about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and say, well, trust the plan. Is he even in the embassy? You know, Trump's going to bring him to the U.S. and save him. So what I guess I'm saying is that there's there's the narratives that come from the media, and then there are also equally narratives that have to be dispelled that are spread, um, you know, through different venues that we have to address because it really is important to get conservatives active and motivated to to act for uh, in support of Assange and WikiLeaks. And I'm concerned that there are so many pacified conservatives on that issue. Yeah. Well, you know, the majority is always going to be pacified. It's a minority that we have to get. And, and, and you know, some people complain about preaching to the choir. My view is that we have to preach to the choir because we have to get the choir to sing better, sing more loudly, and bring people more into the choir. And that goes across the political spectrum. Right, uh, absolutely. Liberals, conservatives, progressives, radicals, socialists, libertarians, anarchists, whatever. Anarchists. Yeah. And, and I think your point that you're making about the misinformation is key. Uh, as I said, the foundation of every movement is education. And the, uh, the main tactic of those in power is misinformation. And I'm, I, I expect that they're behind a lot of those false stories. I agree. I agree. Definitely. And so we have a constant job. I mean, it, it's a con you know, if you go to the School for Social Transformation or Popular Resistance, you'll see a constant job of the movement is correcting misinformation. And that's why this is so important, this, the, the Justice for Julian effort, the consortium news work, the work that we do on popular resistance, this independent media, and the work of WikiLeaks, because that is the primary, the first task that leads to success is people understanding what's really going on around them, because we're exactly. often told falsehoods about what's going on around us. And so it's our job as activists, media is our job, uh, as, as one of our key jobs as activists, you can't organize people who are ignorant. You know, you have to organize, you have to educate first and organize second, and you can't mobilize people who aren't organized. And so that's the progression, educate, organize, mobilize. And I think we saw that in a kind of a small capsule here with this recent threat by Ecuador, immediate education, fantastic education, the threat was immediate. Within hours, he could be released. Educated, organized people. We got these, this, your, your efforts. Other people putting out, the social media went wild uh, with, with this. So people got immediately educated and organized. And then you saw mobilization. People are outside the embassy. And even at high levels, you started to see UN reacting in support of, of Julian Assange. Uh, and so, that was a great s snapshot of how movements can work. And if we continue that, and, and uh, it's important for us to continue that as a campaign, because campaigns allow movements to grow. And so we should not see this as just one s victory. We see this as part of an ongoing campaign, not just to protect Julian Assange, but to allow for the democratization of media. Uh, and so if we make this a campaign, we will have to find, very, and, and we, luckily a lot of people have now been activated. And so we ha I want to encourage everybody listening to be creative and figure out how they can organize their networks, what kind of mobilization they can take, what kind of images they can put out in protest or in social media or in other ways. Uh, because it's, that's what movements, what's great about movements. When you, when you have a movement, it gets beyond the ability of a few people and becomes the creativity of multitudes. And that creativity of multitudes leads to more people being organized, leads to more people being activated. And that's what, this has gotta be seen, this victory of the within hours threat being stopped needs to be turned into an ongoing, I know for you it already is an ongoing campaign. <laughs> I know, and then for me too, I mean, I, I wrote about WikiLeaks years ago. I supported Chelsea Manning and the Chelsea Manning Support Network group. Uh, and so this is an ongoing campaign for me too. But I think more of us have got to make this a priority because no issue, no issue is going to advance 
if those in power and those in the corporate media are allowed to set the narrative. The issues will advance when the narrative is the truth and the truth will advance when the democratized media can get the truth out over the falsehoods that we get from those in power and those in the corporate media. Yeah, and I think that uh, what you were saying about uh, the education of the public is something that reminds me of one of uh, Julian Assange's uh, quotes that he had in his Twitter biography while he was still allowed to operate Twitter. And it was something to the effect of that, he, you know, he was unlocking the chains of ignorance in, in right. people. And I think that, right. you know, since he's been silenced and uh, although WikiLeaks is obviously still operational, uh, you know, that is something that we have to take on as a battle cry maybe and just go forward with that. And I think that, uh, you know, as you're saying about about the fact that this has been a success, that's such a great um, optimistic way of looking at this situation, which can equally be looked at as a dire kind of like devolution of, of circumstances that Assange has been put through. But, um, you know, and I've been really humbled and honored to see how many guests have, have really looked at the situation in a genuinely optimistic way. And I think that is really galvanizing as well. Uh, for the audience to hear that and be motivated that we can make a difference in this. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting how people get motivated. Um, right. you, get, you can get motivated by a dire situation and a threat. And you also can get motivated by, by building on your success. And so I think it's important to recognize that success, uh, but realize that this is not, this is not, it's not a complete success. It's a, it's a success of this moment. This immediate threat. Uh, and now we have to keep building to build a greater success of getting the United States to drop this threat of prosecution. It's a building block. It's one yeah. block in the wall that hasn't been built yet. <laughs> completely, and, completely and, this, yet. and getting the United States to stop is, not, is going to come from both inside the United States, and we need to make sure that we get some of these presidential candidates who claim to be progressives to come out and support Julian Assange. We need to have that as part of the political dialogue, but also has to come from outside the United States. U.S. pressure, I mean, U.S. empire is dying. U.S. is abusing its economic power with economic wars in multiple countries. More and more countries are ready to stand against the United States. And this prosecution of the person who published articles that showed the crimes of the United States, the corruption of the United States by transnational corporate interests and weapons makers and Wall Street, you know, that is a reason why we need to all be active in a campaign. Um, and we need to have it coming from the outside as well. Governments and activists around the world need to start telling the United States, threatening Julian Assange is unacceptable. Your war crimes are unacceptable. Your threats to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, for investigating US war crimes, for investigating Israeli war crimes is unacceptable. We need to build up the international court structure so that even the United States, not just some African corrupt politician, but even the United States is held accountable. Maybe most importantly, the United States is held accountable. Uh, the ICC needs to investigate the United States and needs to hold not just the low level troops who are put in a situation that's untenable, but the high level decision makers elected and uh, in the top brass of the US military and intelligence community are held accountable for their crimes. That's when we will start to develop a world that's moving toward peace by putting in place a court system that substitutes for war, a conflict resolution system that substitutes for war. And so exposing the war crimes of the United States by WikiLeaks is a critical step in that direction. Now we've got to push to make those war crimes prosecuted internationally and domestically and we need a push to stop the United States from threatening the person who blew the whistle on war crimes and corporate crimes and corporate corruption. So I'm really pleased to be on this and thank you so much for the incredible organizing job that you're doing, uh, holding this vigil for multiple days in order to stop this uh, horrible threat. And we need to now figure out how to build on this victory, broaden this movement, create national consensus, indeed international consensus in support of the democratized media of WikiLeaks and the future of freedom of the press in the US and around the world uh, by getting these this threat of prosecution stopped. And I think we can do it. We have the people power to do it. We just have to not be afraid to build it and use it.